glad that you all are here this morning. It's a beautiful morning. I love that it's white outside. We could use a little bit more, but it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful day. I love living in the Midwest and seeing the four seasons throughout the year. It's a, it's a blessing. So church, I'm excited about where we're, we're going this year. 2024 is going to be a very big year for South Lake. This year, if you didn't know, our church turns 100 years old. That's pretty amazing today. Uh, when you look at statistics and how many churches close across this country every year, to have a church say that we're 100 years old and we're still going strong is uh, a very powerful statement. So throughout the year, we are planning to do a, a number of things. Uh, we're going to be doing a number of smaller events. Uh, and as we actually figure out what those are going to be, uh, we will put those out to you. And then we are going to have a larger event uh, by the time we get to September where we celebrate um, turning 100. And all of those things, as we get closer, we'll make those available to you. But I want to start this anniversary, this celebration in the right way. I'm going to start by reading scripture. And it's perhaps the most important scripture we could read in pertaining to our church. It comes from Matthew 28, beginning in verse 18. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. It is the Great Commission, it is the charge by Jesus for the church. Go and make disciples, baptize them, teach them. But we are to go. It's a call to action. It's a, a rally cry. If you were in the military, it was the sound of the trumpet calling us to do something, to march. And I want to begin telling about the history of South Lake this morning because I think it's important then we look at our history so we know where we're going. But it's kind of funny. You know, I don't know if you saw it behind me happen. But I said, it's the history of South Lake, but it's not. It's his story of South Lake. You see, for over 100 years, this hasn't been my church. It hasn't been your church. It's his church. This is his story, what he is doing through faithful servants. We have to begin there because if we don't recognize this being his church, we're already off on the wrong trajectory. This is God's church. He established this church. He established it with this passage that I just read from Matthew. What's interesting with the Church of the Nazarene and like many other what we call mainline denominations, other denominations, do you realize that we can trace our heritage back all the way to the book of Acts? There's no break in it. We didn't just create a church out of nothing. We just didn't decide to come up with our own doctrine. Rather, the church has been passed down to us for over 2,000 years. I want us to start with that. And it starts with the calling. Jesus says, go and make disciples. A little over 100 years ago, there were a few people who took that literally the creation of this church began when seven people asked Reverend C.C. C. White to come to the Glen Park area, area of Gary, Indiana and plan a church that would be part of the Church of the Nazarene denomination. 
As a result, a small Christian mission was opened at 3974 Washington Street in Gary on March 1st, 1922. And on January 1st, 1923, the mission officially was recognized as the Glen Park Mission of the Church of the Nazarene. And we have a picture of that. This church, there's your beginning. It's not even a church. It's a little storefront mission. Struggling to survive in truth. What we know from our own records is during the first two years, the church plant struggled while encountering many uh, discouragements and problems. The challenges were so great that the decision was made to give up the task. To give up the mission. It's just not working. So we're going to walk away from it. (laughs) But God was not done with his church. Out of the seven people that started the mission, only two remained. Both were women. They remained faithful to the call. What follows is a record of a critical encounter with God that impacted our church history. These two women met in the mission hall to clean for the last time. After having prayer, they felt God had asked them if they were going to tear down the only altar that existed in Glen Park. Imagine that. Two faithful servants going to the altar for the very last time, praying, God, I don't know what you have planned, but we're not seeing anything. And they felt the Holy Spirit say, are you really going to give up? Are you going to remain faithful? (laughs) Well, following the Holy Spirit, they committed to the church plant. The next day, the two women purchased lots at 4357 Massachusetts Street as a future home for a permanent church structure. So these two women have no evidence, none, that the church is going to work. You need to hear that. It's not flourishing. It's not going great. People aren't giving high fives. Woo-hoo-hoo! We're doing great. People are leaving. Founding members. See ya. It's not working. But they were listening. This is the point. They were praying and they were listening. Here's how God responds. Can we pull up the next picture? In a matter of years, it goes from two women to 12 founding members to 176 in that picture. Two women, faithful to their God, in prayer, actively listening to God. We have a problem in the church. We think that we always have to see tremendous growth, that everything has to be going stellar. And then I'll get on board. Then I'll participate. When I see things work, and then I'll get on board. When I see God move, and then I'll get on board. You don't see that in Scripture. What you see is the heart of these two women. And the result is this. Men, women, and children. That's our church. That is our history. Our church is here because God wanted our church to succeed. And he made sure that those two women had not only faith, but great faith. Faith so big that they purchased land for a church when the mission was failing. (laughs) They answered the call God placed on their hearts. We need to start there. 
We need to start this place this morning. Faith is beautiful when it's lived out. It's scary. Walking in the unknown. But if you're faithful, it's beautiful. Maggie and I have done it many times in our life. In our marriage, we've stepped out into the unknown. God, I don't know what you have in store. But I know it's beautiful. These two women had faith and look at the result of that. So to help us remain centered this year, I want to talk about our passage for the year, which has something that all of us can hold on to, something that we can meditate on to help us remain focused. And so our scripture from the year is going to be 1 Samuel 3, verses 9 and 10. And it reads, And Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down. And it shall be, if he calls you, that you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Then the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Now, I have to admit, if you don't know the context of this, this may seem like a little weird, like that's our passage for the year? We've gotten in a habit as Christians We've bought into consumerism marketing that unless the passage is flashy and makes a bold statement, we we don't buy it. We don't put it on our walls. We don't wear it in jewelry. We don't have a t-shirt made. But that's not what Scripture was ever intended for. Scripture is made to be transformational. That it is God speaking to us, telling us something. And in this case... It's a beautiful story. I'm going to say this. If you don't know the story of Samuel, go study it this week. He's an amazing individual, and guess what? It's not in one book, but rather in multiple books that you'll have to read to get to understand Samuel. This passage speaks into who we need to be, a people willing to answer the call of God. I want to back up just two verses in verse 7. It reads, Now Samuel did not know the Lord, nor had the word of the Lord yet been revealed to him. See, what you don't know is Samuel is a little boy. He's been given to God through a promise that was made. And his mother is honoring the covenant that she made with God. And so she gives her son Samuel to the temple. And he's sleeping in the temple. And this is kind of one of those funny moments in Scripture where you go, I really don't understand. How does he miss it? It says that Samuel doesn't yet know the Lord. And you're sleeping in the temple. In the FBI, we call that a clue. But with him is his mentor, Eli, the priest. And so he's asking Eli, didn't you call me? You kept saying, Samuel, Samuel. And Eli says, no, that's the Lord. And when the Lord calls you, you respond by saying your servant is listening. Samuel does that. Here's what you don't know and we don't have time to cover this morning. Samuel is perhaps the greatest judge of Israel. He's certainly one of the greatest. He's the last judge of Israel. Samuel is charged with an unsurmountable task. He has to change how Israel is governed. I know that's not an exciting topic, But it is incredibly difficult because here's what happens. 
they're ruled, Israel is ruled by judges. And what you need to understand is those judges are sometimes over just a tribe, sometimes they're over a region, and sometimes they're over the entire nation of Israel. And it's not really working, and Israel looks to the pagan nations around them, and they say, well, we want a king, we want to be like these other nations. They have an earthly person that represents them. And Eli doesn't want to do this. He pleads with God. Not Eli, sorry, Samuel. And Samuel doesn't want to do this. He pleads with God and he he says to God, they should be worshiping you. And, And God says, no, give them what they want. I'll deal with it. And so Israel becomes led by kings. Samuel anoints the first two kings of Israel. He anoints Saul and he anoints David. The impact that Samuel has on Israel is immense and far-reaching and it's a critical part of Israel's history. And yet, we start from a place where it says, and Samuel did not yet know the Lord. Why did we say this this morning? Because sometimes I think we sit in the pews and we go, I really don't know God well yet. I'm not prepared to do his work. I don't know what he wants of me. Instead of just saying, God, your servant, Michael, is listening. What do I do? You see, some of you are still trusting in your own abilities. There's no way Samuel can change the government of a nation and everybody be okay with it. There's no way that one man can do everything that Samuel did. That's the point. It's God that's doing it. So when you get to a point where you really believe in God and you really start trusting in him, then crazy, beautiful, wonderful things begin to happen. And it all happened because Samuel was actively listening to God's voice and he was actively submitting to what God asked him to do. Sounds like we chose this passage this year because we, like Samuel, are being called to do God's will. The question is, will you answer the call? Will you answer the call? This is going to be so important to answer this question this year. Part of it is we made banners. You can see on each side of the sanctuary. Answer the call. It has the reference to our uh, passage at the very top. And when you look at the picture, there is a boardwalk going out into a body of water. You can see across the dunes, very fitting for northwestern Indiana, right against Lake Michigan. You see this path, empty, light at the end of it. And we're looking at that, and it's as if God is saying, just follow what I lay out before you. It'll be okay. Trust me. Others have done this. What do I mean by others? A hundred years worth of faithful servants. Not just pastors, not just board members, not just the congregation. It takes everyone. A hundred years worth of faithful people. And it started with two. Two. 
So I want to talk about what our priorities are going to be as we answer the call, because if you notice on the bottom of that banner, it says preparing South Lake for the next 100 years. We're looking forward, church. We're called here for a reason, to build up the church for the next generation. So we're looking forward. How do we do that? We have to set some priorities on what we're going to be doing as a church. So number one, we are a church that is in love with Jesus. Let me clarify that. We just don't have a love for Jesus, but we are in love with Jesus Christ. We seek him every day to sustain us in this life for the purpose that he has for us. We engage with him passionately and we walk with him, allowing him to lead us in all that we do. That's what I mean when I say that we are in love with Jesus. Not some cute, oh, that sounds good on a Sunday morning. But I mean, I want you to be in love with your Savior. Are you? Do you have a love for him or are you in love with him? You need to answer that question yourself. Number two, we are a disciple-making church. So when you walk out these doors right here, there's a poster that tells about the very origins of our church. And it begins with Matthew 28, the Great Commission. And then it goes into telling the story of South Lake. But see, we did that for a reason. It begins with the call of Jesus saying, go and make disciples. Nothing happens until God tells us what to do. He gave us that command, so we are going to fulfill it. So we are a disciple-making church. We will fulfill the Great Commission to the best of our ability, always. As long as I am behind this pulpit, we will make disciples of everyone in this church. Our disciples will understand the importance of evangelism, of serving, of generosity, because of their love for God and what he has done for them, to them, and through them. Our disciples will receive a transformational life and will be transformational in the lives of others. That's what disciples do. Disciples don't come in and sit on a Sunday morning. Disciples are engaged with the body of Christ all the time in many different ways. So we are a disciple-making church. Number three, we minister to everyone in the church. Cradle to grave. From the time an infant is born and finds its way into our nursery, it will experience the love of God. As that infant grows into a child, it will receive instruction on who God is and how that child can begin to live out their faith. We will help people learn how to use their God-given gifts and talents in their lives and in their careers. We will develop relationships that foster growth, encouragement, and support. And as we enter the final years of our lives, we'll care for and show love to those who have faithfully went before us. We will love our church from cradle to grave with intent and purpose. And number four, we build effective ministries that positively impact the people of Lake and Porter counties. Our ministries will have a direct impact upon the evil of this world. They will help people break addictions, recover from mistakes, escape the bondage of sin, and simply just receive the love of Christ in such a way that they are moved to join a church 
where that love is lived out consistently. So here is how we are going to function for the next hundred years. We're setting the pace this morning. We will worship. In our worship, we select our worship music not because it is a current hit on Christian radio or it makes it feel warm and fuzzy inside. We select our worship music because it centers us on God and draws our attention to Him and what He has done for us. In our preaching, our goal, when I say our goal, I mean Nick and I, as your pastors, Our goal is not to give you a TED Talk or give you a motivational speech or simply to evoke an emotion from you. That's not our goal. Our goal each and every week is to deliver Bible-based sermons that allow God to teach all of us, including Nick and I. If you don't know this, both Nick and I have a rhythm when we preach, who's ever preaching on Thursday morning, you won't find us at this pulpit preaching. And guess who the first one that hears the sermon is each and every week? The preacher. The message we give starts with us. If we are not moved by God's word, then how can we expect you to be? Oh, boy, there's a radical thought, huh? So we practice not just to deliver a cute message, but to be moved and shaped by the very word that we speak ourselves. So we will, we will preach to you faithfully every week. In our discipleship, this will be at the core of who we are from now on. Our discipleship is not some... 10 week program where at the end you receive a certificate I don't understand that I, I see churches doing that they'll, they'll have a discipleship program or a discipleship class attend for 6 to 10 weeks and you're a disciple can you point to that in scripture because the apostles walked with Christ for years That's why our journey takes time, it takes dedication, it takes sacrifice to be a disciple. And it's a sacrifice because we will go into a deep dive into what it means to be a Christian and what it means to be a Nazarene. We build a foundation first of our Christian faith. Do you even know what it means to be a Christian? Do you understand the very faith that you proclaim So we're going to do a deep dive into that. And then once we have that set in place, then we're going to come back and say, okay, here's what it means to be a Nazarene. Since you're part of the church in the Nazarene, you should know that. This is the lens that we see our Christian faith being lived out through. So we spend time at that. Our goal at the end of discipleship is that you would be more in love with God, with his word, with your own faith, with this denomination, and with this church. You should love it. It's his after all. When we think about our mission, as we build ministries in the future, we will not build ministries that make us want to pat ourselves on the back. Let me explain that one. I may step on some toes here, And I'm sorry if I do, but please hear me out. There are a lot of churches, I'm I'm going to give you an example, who do, uh, in fall, they do a thing called trunk or treat. Maybe they've changed it to be more Christian. They call it uh, a fall harvest festival. And we bring people in from the community we load kids up with candy, we, we dress up our cars, and we send them on our way. And at the end of that, the church goes, oh, we did good. We had a community event. And it has this much impact on the community. 
Have you ever thought what really happens at a trunk or treat? We set up a trunk or treat so we can reach the community and oftentimes in the background is for those who cannot trick or treat safely or those who are underprivileged and have no means to. So we're going we're gonna to do a trick or treat for them. Those children usually come from poverty stricken areas. They don't have good diets. They don't know safety. So we're going to load them up with sugar, never share the gospel with them, never mention church, and send them on their way and think that we did something good. Church, we're not going to do that. And I'm sorry if I offended anyone but you need to understand what we're doing here. When we build ministries, they will be tangible ministries that have an impact, that actually provide something for the community around us, both Christian and non-Christian. We'll develop ministries that speak to the things that plague our communities. How do we break addictions? How do we offer love to foster children? How do we clothe the naked? How do we feed the hungry? Those are the things that this church will be engaged in from here on out. And in our fellowship, when we gather together, and we must gather together, we're not going to group ourselves into little cliques or pockets of isolated people who don't practice their faith. Right? We do this. We're human. We go and we sit with those that we know. Or if we're really uncomfortable and we really don't want to live out our faith, let me go find somebody that's doing the same. And I'll sit with them and we'll talk about how miserable life is. Whoops. Whoops. No. I've said this many times before. We are eternal brothers and sisters. Do you understand that? I have family that I will not see in heaven that are blood. But I will see you. We are eternal brothers and sisters. So why not get to know one another this side of eternity? After all, we're going to spend it together. Right? Right? We need to spend time together. We will gather as eternal brothers and sisters, all of us who are created differently and coming from many different backgrounds and cultures, all of us who are made in the image of God. That's who we're going to fellowship with. As we gather in fellowship, we will encourage, motivate, help, and guide each other into being a better people and a better church. That's what fellowship is. That's our charge for the next hundred years. That's at least where we're going to start. We have priorities and we have a way to live it out. The only thing that remains is, will you answer the call? Jesus says, go and make disciples. Baptize them and teach them. Are you going to do that, church? Are you going to be faithful to him? Not to me, not to South Lake, not to the denomination, but to Jesus Christ, your Savior. Will you be faithful to him in this process? Just like Samuel, we need to have the posture of saying, your servant is listening. And then when God speaks, we move where he tells us to. To help us set the tone for this next 100 years, in particular for this year, if we're going to celebrate 100 years 
of God being faithful to this church, not that we were faithful, but that he was. We're going to begin from a place of prayer. So I'm going to ask the, the church board to come forward. Not, I understand not all of them are here this morning, but we're going to gather down here. And I'm going to pray over the church this morning. I'm very intentionally vacating the pulpit because it's not mine. You need to see something. You need to see something from your leadership and from your staff. See, here's what we recognize. That belongs to God. And God alone. And so, we're going to take a stance to pray to him for this church. It has been God who established this church, who has led this church, who has brought new people into this church, and who has sustained this church for the past 100 years. Because of this, we, meaning the leadership of the church, are demonstrating a posture of humility for all of you to witness and learn from. So I don't do this very often, but I'm going to turn my back on you because I'm praying to God. I'm praying with you and I'm praying for you. So I'm going to turn and when I do that, would you bow your head as I pray for this church? Father, thank you for establishing South Lake 100 years ago. Thank you for speaking to these two women as they went forward to pray at the altar for the last time. Thank you for strengthening their faith. Thank you for giving them the money to purchase the land that eventually became our first church building. Thank you for all of the faithful servants who went before us, who gave so selflessly to your will for this church. Now it is our turn. Father, send the Holy Spirit to lead us, to instruct us, and to convict us. Equip us to do your will here on earth. Father, may we always fulfill the Great Commission. May discipleship always be at the heart of this church so that we can pass this faith on from one generation to the next. May we always have a hunger to study and reflect your word. May we find joy in what you reveal to us through the Holy Bible. May your word always be proclaimed from this pulpit. May it be a, may it be a source of truth that is consistent and unwavering in this crazy world. We pray that our worship on Sunday mornings is pleasing to you because it is centered on you. In our songs, we will give thanks, we will proclaim you as Lord, we will repent, and we will unite in both song and love because you are our Father. May our prayers be consistent, more of a conversation than a task, task we have to achieve. May they be bold and hungry in seeking you and doing your will. May our prayers rise to you and be pleasing to your ears because you can hear the growth in our faith as well as the unity in our corporate prayers that we are praying as one people before our holy God. Father, may your church be a beacon for the lost, leading them into a relationship with you. May this church be a church that clothes the naked, feeds the hungry, and protects the widow and the orphan. Father, our prayer is that all of us would share the gospel as often as you make the opportunity arise before us. With joy and love in our hearts, we will tell the story of how you have changed us forever, and we will invite those we share our testimonies with to come to your church and be part of this loving community. Because of what we were asking, Father, protect us from all evil. Allow no evil to work its way into our lives, 
our marriages, our relationships, and our church. Send as many angels as necessary to protect us and shield us from the dark forces of this world. Prepare us for persecution. As we pray this bold prayer, we recognize that we will have opposition and resistance. Develop our faith and our confidence to not only expect this, but to not be shaken by it at all. May persecution break upon us as water breaks upon rock. May the demonstration of our faith through loving action be a catalyst for change in this world. Lastly, Father, in all we do, may we reflect the image of your precious Son. May our actions, our words, and our deeds glorify him to everyone around us. We humbly submit to your will, and the entire church said, Amen. Board, you may be seated. So, as the worship team comes forward this morning, we are going to close in song. We are going to worship our Lord, and we've chose a song that reflects Samuel's action so well. It, the song is called, Called Me Higher. It's a song about what little we could do in response to God's call or how we can be like Samuel, a boy with no faith or a man of great faith responding to the call of God. The song is a call to action. It's a move from comfort to confidence, a move from just loving God to loving others. It's about finding security and confidence to fulfill the great commission that we read this morning. So let us proclaim and worship how we are going to answer the call God has placed upon South Lake for the next 100 years. Church, if you would like to receive a blessing this morning, would you simply rise and hold out your hands like this? South Lake, you have been blessed by a, God, by a church that God has established over a hundred years ago. A church that has an incredible calling that you get to be a part of. That you get to be an active role in being the body of Christ. Be brave enough follow that call be brave enough to go into the wild unknown you will be blessed beyond your understanding when you take that leap of faith so hug somebody tell them you love them and share the gospel of Jesus Christ with the world around you God bless you all we'll see you next week